Welcome to this uh, session of the uh, Brisbane Festival of Ideas. And this evening, we've got Barbara Gunnell uh, on her topic, uh, Whistles and Leaks, What Do We Really Need to Know? And I'll just tell you uh, about uh, Barbara. Uh, she's a writer and editor based in London. Uh, she was assistant editor of The Independent on Sunday from 1992 to 1997. She was the comment editor of The Observer from 2002 to 2006 and associate editor of The New Statesman from 2006 to 2009. She's a past president of the National Union of Journalists in the UK and is currently a regular contributor to The Observer. Her essay, A Bend in the River, appeared in Griffith Review 25 after the crisis. And uh, her current essay in uh, Griffith Review 32 on the subject of uh, Assange's trials uh, is entitled Their Wicked Problems, Exquisite Dilemmas. So I'm sure we're all eagerly anticipating Barbara's comments this evening. Can I ask you please to welcome Barbara Gunnell? Thank you very much. Um, I haven't tested the mics, but I'm hoping you can hear me. Yeah? Good. Okay, that's great. Um, it's a great privilege to be here. Um, sorry, you want this closer? Okay, just uh, keep me informed. Um, <laughs> Uh, at, a at a festival I of ideas, as, as we all are at, and I think it's uh, important, um, uh, certainly worth acknowledging, that in the space of just one year, we've had to deal with an explosion of ideas resulting from WikiLeaks' astonishing rise to fame. Um, launching its uh, 2010 report this month, Amnesty International singled out WikiLeaks and the papers cooperating with WikiLeaks over publication of the leak of diplomatic cables as contributing to a landmark year in terms of human rights. The year 2010, that they wrote, may well be remembered as a watershed year with activists and journalists, when activists and journalists used new technology to speak truth to power and in so doing push for greater respect for human rights, uh, Amnesty's Secretary General Salil Shetty said. It's also the year when repressive governments faced the real possibility that their days were numbered now that's no mean, a mean achievement, it's a remarkable statement of optimism and a great achievement for WikiLeaks. I want to look at different aspects of that achievement in the hope that it helps us answer the question, which is the question um, of the session, which is what do we really need to know? And so first let's just have a quick background. I'm, I'm sure you're all experts on the Assange case, but I just will put it slightly in context. Um, I mean, as we all know, it was the brainchild of Julian Assange who created a network um, of sites to protect the identity of would-be whistleblowers around about 2006, 2007. Uh, despite a number of sensational releases since then, which uh, give the US government and many other bodies an urgent motive to close down the site. I mean, these uh, include the Afghanistan war logs, the Iraq war logs, the video showing the killing of civilians in Iraq from an Apache helicopter, um, WikiLeaks has, has proved impossible to stop. Assange had created um, a system that could not be censored and which gave whistleblowers the guarantee of, anonymous, uh, of anonymity. Um, in 2010, WikiLeaks published some sensational leaks. Uh, a government or company that wanted to remove Wik from WikiLeaks, uh, to remove any content at all from those sites would find it nearly impossible. It's been able to resist libel threats and court injunctions. Uh, things no paper could risk publishing um, uh, have been put on the WikiLeaks website. The, um, the impact of such a site was always destined to have a, a, a tremendous impact, I mean, both on journalism and politics. I mean, that was always going to be the case. Um, but the transforming moment, in my opinion, was the publication of the US diplomatic cables at the end of 2010. When it became clear that there were a quarter of a million of these documents, uh, we've had less than 10% published so far, it was obvious that the US would do all in its power to deal with um, WikiLeaks in some way to, to, to stop um, this, this dangerous activity of leaking its secrets. We should not be surprised at that. Um, I'm sure Julian Assange isn't. What happened next was not expected, though. Um, Assange was accused of sexual assault in Sweden 
Um, we await the results of a rather technical legal debate about extradition between European states, in, uh, in, um, uh, which is going on in Britain at the moment. There's an, an appeal lodged and we still have to wait for that. And meanwhile, he remains under house arrest in, in Norfolk. And the reopening of the site for submissions is sort of somewhat in abeyance amidst, as, as you all will have read, these, the difficulties amongst uh, WikiLeaks itself. So this mix of fame and scandal and secrets has rocketed Julian Assange to international celebrity um, so that he's now become one of the most photographed, written about and debated people in the world. So the first question really I put to myself about this is, is that uh, are the ideas we're talking about uh, the direct responsibility of one man? Could, in other words, could WikiLeaks have happened without Assange? And I think that's quite an interesting uh, question. Um, first of all, the idea of an open site which, which you can lodge seek, um, uh, documents, you can put documents safely, um, did have its predecessors. For example, a site called Cryptome.org, um, invented by John Young, who was once a, a former sort of colleague and, and friend of Assange, um, did provide a, a kind of drop box for secret documents. But I think WikiLeaks went a long way beyond this, both technically, but more importantly, philosophically. I would say from Assange's own writings and reliable biographical snippets that he's a child of a particular time and set of circumstances that, that uh, amongst other things, led him to distrust and despise government secrecy and to see the computer and his own coding expertise as weapons for resisting unjustified control over his life. It soon became his mission to use that expertise on behalf of human rights and all vulnerable people. In other words, he realized that he had both the skills and the intellect to take on government bu bureaucracies. I, in my view, he's done that with, with courage to, to challenge the United States Intelligence Service and, and its cyber police uh, and win is both courageous and clever. And this was acknowledged in the award of the Sydney Peace Prize um, uh, a couple of weeks ago in London, a very small event, but uh, um, very important, given for exceptional courage in pursuit of human rights. By the way, I, it, it was a small event because um, he's still under house arrest, <laughs> and so the difficulty of finding places he's allowed to go is, is quite difficult. Um, so uh, the, the second question I think um, that's raised by this is, is has, has this remarkable sort of progress really within one year? Has this changed journalism? I mean, is it going to change journalism? Um, and Bill Keller, the executive editor of the New York Times, who's a, a, a journalist of considerable stature himself, um, and whose paper benefited enormously from um, the uh, existence of WikiLeaks, I mean, having been one of the conduits for publication of quite a few of their, their, their scoops. Um, and he, he gives an extremely ungenerous uh, answer to this question. In, um, and he wrote, frankly, I think the impact of WikiLeaks on the culture has probably been overblown. Long before WikiLeaks was born, the internet transformed the landscape of journalist. Well, uh, sorry, the landscape of journalism. Um, to me, that misses the point um, because things always look simple after they've happened, don't they? Um, just as Facebook now seems an obvious extension of the chat rooms and college sort of um, email groups, and Twitter just looks a, a mere extension of texting. Um, it's easy to think that a WikiLeaks Dropbox uh, for gathering and disseminating documents while protecting sources was inevitable. But the genius of WikiLeaks was not just in devising the programming, but seeing the potential. And um, there's a, a, an interest, I don't know uh, how many of you have seen the film Social Network, but um, there's, a, a very, uh, there's a, a line in that which I think sort of encapsulates this, this um, uh, kind of issue. Uh, in, the, in the film Social, um, uh, sorry, the legal challenge to um, Mark Zuckerberg's ownership of f Facebook by the Winklevoss twins. Um, and the film sort of uh, plays out this sort of big legal debate. And he, at one point, exasperatedly um, 
uh, turns to the Winklevoss twins and he says, look, if you could have invented Facebook, you would have invented Facebook. <laughs> and in a way, that's uh, the same is true of WikiLeaks. If, I mean, if it was so obvious, as um, some people say, uh, as the next big step, then obviously uh, New York Times itself would have done it. And I think, you know, the genius is not just in the practicalities. The genius is in applying the technique, the, the technology to a future vision. And that, that, in the end, is, is what it will be judged by. Um, it's interesting to note, too, that of the promised copycat sites, um, uh, none yet is successfully online and able to promise full security. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, as we know, um, did announce its new secrets drop box, but it, um, it explicitly states... Um, uh, and I quote exactly, you agree not to use safe house for any unlawful purpose. We reserve the right to disclose any information about you to law enforcement authorities <laughs> or to a requesting third party without notice. <laughs> and this is quite simply a, a travesty of the original idea. So, um, you know, things look simple and inevitable, but sometimes the story is more complex. Um, one of the issues that, that is uh, continuously raised uh, because there's a, a secret, well, it's not so secret anymore, but a secret agenda on it, is the question of whether Assange um, and his fellow workers are journalists. And um, since I've been in, in journalism for a long time, I thought I'd have a stab at answering that question. <laughs> um, uh, the trade of journalism is, is I mean, extremely ill-defined in almost every country. Um, so it's slightly puzzling to me that the, the question is asked so often and intently as if you know, one expects him to sort of produce a sort of certificate of practice like a barrister or um, a doctor. Um, and in fact, um, the reason this question is assuming such importance is, um, is that if, as could happen, um, Assange ends up in the United States facing charges, for example, under the Espionage Act, uh, then his journalist statement, uh, status becomes incredibly important because um, uh, in that country, uh, for uh, all their other problems, that it, it is the best possible country to practice as a journalist um, because you have the protection of, of uh, free speech and the First Amendment, which, which is quite sort of zealously protected. So if he's described as a leaker or a hacker and not a real journalist, the um, situation is really quite different, as we've seen with Bradley Manning, the alleged source. Um, so it, it would be far easier to prosecute him. Um, uh, it's worth mentioning that actually sometimes the, the freedom um, of speech law in, uh, in, in the States, I mean, it does, does protect um, it, it goes beyond protecting journalists because Daniel Ellsberg, who wasn't a journalist, he was a straightforward whistleblower. Um, but uh, uh, there, was a, there was certainly an attempt to prosecute him, but uh, that having failed, that actually the law protecting whistleblowers and journalists was strengthened. Um, but those who want him prosecuted as a spy or a traitor or a leaker um, are, are, I think, arguing, um, are barking up the wrong tree by arguing that he's, uh, he, he's not a journalist. In fact, under any definition of journalism, um, uh, he clearly is. He collects information, he edits it, a process that is very clear in, in the, film, the edited version of the film he made with um, colleagues in Iceland, Collateral Murder. Um, and even if his only contribution um, to the various leaks that have been had been data management, he would still be a journalist um, because we've, we've, we've probably all seen too many Hollywood films which assume that every journalist is an investigative journalism, but actually data, data journal, uh, uh, journalism I mean, is not new at all. It's, it's the very basis of journalism. And um, uh, if... Uh, if he is prosecuted under the Espionage Act, then Bill Keller, the executive editor of the New York Times, should also be worried. Um, in terms of the kind of journalism it is, uh, Assange has a theory that you can have such a thing as scientific journalism, um, wh by which he means that by providing data without interpretation, uh, he is offering the reader the chance to make up his or her own mind. 
Um, I'm not sure that that works completely. I mean, I think that, for example, uh, if, you, if I offered you the entire database of the last um, election results, you wouldn't really read every sort of single result before you sort of would accept the headline, opposition wins. I mean, the fact is that you, the, the data uh, can be given to you, but we all appreciate editing. Um, uh, you know, maybe the best definition of a journalist is someone who serves up information, and sometimes that information's raw, and sometimes it's cooked, but uh, it's basically information. Um, as the Guardian, the New York Times, the Sydney Morning Herald, the Melbourne Age, and other WikiLeaks partners over recent months discovered, the task of analyzing, corroborating, contextualizing, presenting, um, all these uh, presenting information, all these remain essential. And uh, anyone who's actually looked at the, um, uh, a fraction of the US diplomatic cables on, on the WikiLeaks site, and there's a searchable database, but um, that searchable database is itself a triumph of journalism. I mean, that's not raw data. That is, I mean, that is a, a, a triumph that you can actually sort of search for something and sort of find the story about Tunisia or Bolivia or whatever. So it's easy to underestimate the um, value of, of being able to read complicated stories edited, but um, I, I'm certainly prepared to say as a long-standing journalist that, that what they do is journalism and, and sometimes very good journalism. Um, the, I think there's also no question that what they've done will change journalism. Um, uh, but as well as that, I think it will also change our perceptions of government and politi uh, politics too. Um, an expression that's frequently used to describe what happened with the, uh, the major uh, WikiLeaks in, um, uh, throughout 2010. Um, is that the gene is out of the bottle now and um, that uh, there will be more and more of these leaks. And certainly that's so, but I'm not sure everyone quite agrees on the nature of the genie. Um, it's not just that we might see many more WikiLeaks or Open Leaks or Wall Street Journal leaks um, that, uh, uh, or Dropboxes. Um, I think um, the, the real escape genie is the public's new perception of secrecy. And, um, and, and that is, I think, a huge change. What, what happened in the second half of 2010, particularly with the diplomatic cables, was that people everywhere became aware, uh, aware of a, a widespread subterfuge by their governments towards their citizens. And what was said in public was absolutely nothing like what was said in private. And, we all knew that in a way, but to have it sort of so demonstrated, um, I think, was quite sensational. Um, the public story about Tunisia was that it was a stable regime that the US could do business with. The real story was that the US recognized it, saw and knew, as did most Tunisians, that the ruling elite was rotten to the core. The stories of bravery and peacekeeping that we heard about in um, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, I'm not, but they, they were true, they were true, those stories, but they turned out also to conceal quite appalling acts of terror on the civilian population. So there was the partial truth, there was distortion of the truth and the partial truth. And the consequence of discovering that, I think, or being confronted with it rather than discovering it, uh, was enormous, and particularly in the Middle East. The people of Tunisia and Egypt discovered that corruption in high places was actually well known in diplomatic circles. Um, the unsayable be immediately became sayable. Um, the genie set free by WikiLeaks um, is that citizens everywhere from Tunis to Paris to Sydney to Brisbane um, demand that their governments operate openly and honestly. Now, I don't know how one can hold on to that optimism um, uh, in the face of evidence every um, almost weekly that um, uh, to the contrary but I do I do think it uh, I do think it's true that actually there's a mood around that demands more openness and eventually that does make a difference I think people don't want to be lied to um, and that's becoming apparent um, the 
stickier questions and, and new ideas that are raised by all this, of course, uh, are in the other half of the questions, which is um, uh, the question of whether in a democracy, I mean, shouldn't the government, uh, a democratically elected government, um, decide what is secret and what isn't? And who is it who, who, who controls the new gatekeepers? Um, I mean, this issue of democratic control is, is important. The relationship between the press and the state in most democracies has developed over sort of decades, and it's quite an elaborate fretwork of obligations and duties, um, you know, expressed both in constitutions in some countries and laws in others and precedents. Um, and it, it's by no means perfect, and, I, and certainly in my own sort of secrecy obsessed country it, it really isn't perfect um, but is it right for there to be an untouchable body you know one which is outside the jurisdiction uh, cleverly puts itself outside the, the jurisdiction of any particular government to have the power if uh, and if not the intention I'm not saying there's an intention to do this but to have the power to release secrets relating to health records for example if someone wanted to leak those or military codes, or intelligence about possible terrorist attacks. And all these issues need thorough debate. Um, we, we all deserve a say in this. It, 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 I mean, it, it is currently, I think, has been expressed quite benignly. I mean, it's been also, um, the consequences so far have, have been relatively without uh, consequences, um, uh, without uh, negative consequences. But, uh, there is there is a problem um, about the democracy of who decides what's being leaked. When the New York Times decided to publish the cables, um, for example, it informed the White House. Now, this is sort of an interesting thing. Is that collusion? It met with representatives of the CIA, the FBI, the Pentagon, and others. It sounds a bit too cosy. But it is, in fact, I think, in some sense, a sign of the strength of the freedom of the press in that country, I mean, that they were able to go. There was never a question that they weren't going to publish, but they forewarned them, they discussed it, they discussed the consequences. Um, but theoretically, at least, the meeting showed mutual concern for the public interest. From this vantage point, WikiLeaks' increasingly secret self-regulation seems a fragile safeguard against the misuse of, of safe. Uh, the misuse of state secrets, I apologise. If whistleblowers are to trust WikiLeaks with important information, I think it has to develop codes of conduct and importantly subject, su subject these codes to a, a, a wider scrutiny and de democratic debate. Um, in the open society that WikiLeaks and Assange believe they are working towards, checks and balances are crucial. Too many countries deny their citizens freedom of in information and expression. But it's not much of a change for the better for those with great technical expertise to wield their power with no peer-agreed controls or democratic mandates. Um, I'd be really interested when we come to the question and answer session not for, for, for views on that because it seems to me to be slightly under-discussed. Um, sorting this out isn't going to be easy and the principles are difficult to discuss among uh, the ad hominem attacks on the personality of... Um, Julian Assange that so absorbs the press. So in a way, we're concentrating on the wrong things. I mean, uh, I perfectly understand that as a journalist, that, um, that these are more interesting, but these wider issues have got to be discuss discussed. If whistleblowing is to become an increasingly important part of the media landscape, then the new kids on the block have got to learn to trust the people. Um, how am I doing for time? I've got an option of it. Yeah, okay, so I'll miss that, I think. Um, so how, how, how many s uh, secrets does the state need? I mean, this is highly contest contested territory in the UK. I would say that Britain lags considerably behind both the United States and Australia in its commitment to open government. We do at least, uh, uh, finally, um, have freedom of information legislation, but the natural instincts of uh, the UK government... Um, uh, are towards security and secrecy. And I'm sure you have your own um, examples of that uh, being true here too. But you, I promise you, you have better legislation than we do. Um, 
Uh, it's taken up to now, for example, to find out what happened in the lead-up to the war in Iraq. That's a bad example because you've just found out what happened to the um, uh, lead-up uh, to the war in Iraq too, haven't you? But uh, we now, after several inquiries and denials that there was any deliberate enriching or sexing up of the evidence for the global threat posed by Saddam Hussein, it has been revealed finally. Um, ironically, while the protection of state secret remains high um, in the UK. The protection of the privacy of individuals is extremely poor. We're legally spied on by both state and business uh, corporations, quite legally. Um, uh, for every 14 people in Britain, there's one surveillance camera, <laughs> which is um, enormous. I think it's the highest in the world. We protect state secret secrets and ignore individual privacy, and this is surely the wrong way around. Um, there's a fundamentalist position that, that calls for total government transparency, and Julian Assange has certainly held it. Um, uh, though working with newspapers, he did draw back from that, and he has, it, he has certainly on several occasions accepted that where individuals are named in government documents, their names should be redacted. Um, that said, apart from the release of the uh, diplomatic cables, um, that we have been given an enormous amount of uh, secret material without the world lurching into crisis. Um, the US didn't collapse, no one was assassinated. Um, US security was not threatened. Robert Gates, the defense secretary, actually said that he believed that the claim that there had been a catastrophic security breach was significantly overwrought, were his words. But there had, he said, been acute embarrassment. Um, I wanted to say something about embarrassment, but I think we'll leave that for... Yes, sir? Yes, sir? Yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> I will say something about embarrassment. Assange says of embarrassment, um, the embarrassment caused to the diplomatic service that they should um, start writing things that they, should, they can be proud of. In fact, um, uh, which uh, is, uh, in fact, rereading his Tunisian cables in the light of subsequent events, Ambassador Robert Godek um, has good reason to be proud. Um, they are well written, which is, I'm sure, why so many of the diplomatic cables got better coverage than the war leaks, is that they're beautifully written. These diplomats have very little else to do, obviously. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, they're readable. And um, if in the American jargon they're merely passing on scuttlebutt, which is the word they used, um, it's very revealing scuttlebutt. He observes that... Uh, Tunisians are frustrated by their lack of political freedom and that the ruling family is corrupt, etc., all the stuff we know. But it wasn't really the actual content that was important, I, uh, I don't think. I mean, it, it, it was, um, I mean, the Tunisians were not being told any secret there. They knew that their leaders were corrupt. It was the fact that the US ambassador was saying it, and that's, that um, uh, it was the important thing. It, uh, if, as we're told, uh, journalists and diplomats frequently exchange such gossip as this, I, I think the question arises, why didn't we get to hear of the serious corruption at the heart of the Tunisian government before WikiLeaks released the cables? And the answer is deniability. There was a private truth and a public truth. Um, a couple of decades ago, a freelance journalist friend of mine was working in Kenya, which, as we know, partly from WikiLeaks, um, was um, astonishingly corrupt and probably the most corrupt country um, in uh, Africa by the time that Daniel Arap Moy had sort of sorted almost uh, every dollar out of there. Um, and uh, sh she was asked to leave the country because her broadcasts were not seen as sufficiently, sort of, by the government, not by um, uh, the BBC, sufficiently respectful um, of uh, Daniel Arap Moy's government. And I was, I was in Kenya uh, for a, sh a short period only reporting on the construction of a dam. So, um, but I happened to be president of the UK National U Union of Journalists at the time. So I went, I went um, uh, to meet the um, British High Commissioner to sort of say, well, you know, this is a really bad show and you can't let this happen. And he sort of nodded and agreed and he sort of said that it was a bad business and, um, so, and suggested I use my influence to get the, B which I didn't have, to get the BBC to give um, the troublesome journalist a nice job in London. And that to him was the diplomatic solution. And he spoke openly to me um, of exactly the kind of corruption that she had been reporting. Um, but if I had repeated those comments, 
and, or told her and she'd repeated them, um, he would just simply have denied them. And that's, I suppose, um, how diplomacy has worked. And maybe that's how diplomacy can no longer work because um, of those um, leaks. So, uh, where, does, um, where does state security stand on this? Uh, the uh, embarrassment or security, I suppose, is, is the issue. I, I'd like to quote something that a, a retired UK senior intelligence officer once told a group of journalists, and maybe he was repenting his past secrecy, I don't know, I mean, or his past sort of collusion in secrecy. Um, but he said, all official secrets are collected on behalf of the public and therefore must be returned to the public. And the only question is when. And that's uh, <laughs> the, 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 the sting is in that uh, tale of the, the question is when. In, in Britain, that can be a very long wait. I don't know what kind of lengths of time you have for official secrets, but we have some official secrets in Britain that cannot be revealed for 100 years. And in the, now this is seldom, obviously, uh, it's seldom because it would be dangerous to um, uh, the nation to reveal something that happened in, I don't know, 1913. Um, uh, it, it, it's because of embarrassment. But the amazing thing is it's because of embarrassment to whom? And it's embarrassment quite often to um, aristocratic families, for example. And there's a very good example of this, which is quite comical, so I will tell you, which is... Um, that a, a very famous um, aristocratic family, the Tweedsdales, I think, uh, but anyway, they're better known as the Mitford family, the Mitford girls, um, uh, uh, had, had, uh, they were a group of mad daughters, um, one of whom, Unity Mitford, developed a crush on Hitler just in the run-up to the war. And um, uh, Hitler took a shine to her, and she went out to see him, um, and they, there are pictures of them all having a nice time with Goebbels. And um, uh, there were rumors of a love child. But when war was declared, um, she had to be shipped back quickly, and she tried to shoot herself. And so she was sent back in this sort of heavily armored car, um, armored, armed train, sorry, um, having apparently a great wound in the head. And um, all, all the papers in the National Archives relating to this story were classified under the 100-year rule. <laughs> so, um, then with the loosening up of information, it became possible to appeal against uh, the 100-year rule. And a friend of mine um, decided he was going to find out about um, uh, what actually happened. And um, so he appealed, and he was successful. And... He appealed and he was successful and um, uh, they got the box open. And he, um, he was about to launch on the world the wonderful story of uh, the Adolf uh, mystery baby. But what he found was um, not quite as he suspected. Um, he found that the papers uh, that were being concealed under a hundred year rule were that when she got back to um, uh, England, Unity had a, an unsuitable affair with the gardener. <laughs> and so um, uh, he was disappointed he didn't get his Hitler baby scoop. And uh, the real mystery is surely why details of an aristocrat crush on Hitler should have the highest secret um, uh, classification poss possible, let alone an affair with a gardener. Um, Okay, now, um, uh, I've still got a tiny bit of time, I think. Um, I'm just going to um, uh, uh, tease you. We, we have a man who has been upsetting powerful government agencies with a highly popular website, which criticizes, criticizes corruption in high places. Uh, naturally, this has brought him under close scrutiny of the security services. There have been attempts to close down his websites intimidate his donors, and he's being uh, prosecuted for a completely unrelated crime. However, his name is not Julian Assange, it's Alexei Navalny. The government um, is not the United States, but that of Russia. I read about Navalny in the Financial Times, but he's been fated in quite a lot of the European, um, of other European and American newspapers. The New Yorker called him the Russian Julian Assange, the New York Times loved the way Navalny takes on big uh, state-owned energy companies in his crusade against graft, kickbacks, and bribery. They dubbed him the new 
Julian Assange, um, as has the Financial Times. I was struck reading about him, how kindly the US and British press were towards Navalny. And he does indeed sound quite admirable. But you feel like shouting, you know, they, he's the new Julian Assange. What have you done with the first Julian Assange? Um, and the fact that, he, that the new Julian Assange is ruffling Russian feathers rather than American ones does wonders for his press coverage. The, the Financial Times correspondent, for example, admires his casual clothes compared with Julian Assange's trademark cream-coloured designer suit, <laughs> which I, I must admit I've never seen. Um, but I'm sure many of you remember that when Assange was uh, once considered rather too casual by the press, and I think um, both the writers of the Guardian book on the subject and the editor of the New York Times um, famously disparage his dishevelled and unwashed appearance. However, Navalny is also praised for his courageous work exposing pervasive corruption at the heart of the decade-old regime of Vladimir Putin. And I just want to say, surely Assange too has exposed a bit of pervasive corruption around the globe. Um, and interestingly, Navalny is also having trouble with the law. Um, and his, the charge that he faces is an old fraud um, charge. And then you sort of think, you know, well, the press have no problem in writing of that as a trumped up charge. I mean, I'm not making any statements about what happened in Sweden, but um, it is much easier to upset only the Russian government um, and be a good, you know, if you do that, you can be a good chap taking on the mighty. But uh, we should warn Navalny now, I think, that uh, how very much more complicated life is going to get for him if, like Julian Assange, he spreads his war on corruption beyond his home country to, say, Britain or Australia or the United States. Um, in conclusion, I'd like to say um, that if, if WikiLeaks had done nothing more than publish a small percentage of its cache of 250,000 diplomatic cables, it would have earned its place in history. People will argue forever over exactly what contribution it made to the Arab Spring. But it was no small thing, surely, for the average um, uh, Tunisian or Egyptian to realize what the American ambassadors um, to their countries uh, genuinely thought um, uh, about the situations there. Um, in Tunisia, they must have thought, um, okay, so they, they're expecting, they've written they're expecting an uprising. What then would Washington do if that predicted uprising took place? And so, um, the question we're asked is, what do we need to know? Um, I think the answer must be always the truth, occasionally delayed to save lives, but not to save face. It is to, uh, I mean, it's the triumph of WikiLeaks, really, that it has contributed to an environment where people will increasingly settle for nothing less, I think. I look forward to your views on this. Came in, you came in perfectly on time too, Barbara. Well done. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, we've got our um, microphone meisters in place, and we might as well start with this gentleman here with his hand straight in the air. Thank, thank you, Barbara. I just wonder why in Australia our press seem um, a bit lazy and reluctant to um, use this vast amount of material um, for real journalism. They seem far more interested in the story of Julian Assange himself and interested in the question of whether Julia Gillard, our Prime Minister, um, said that he broke an Australian law or not or could have broken an Australian law. Um, but compared to the overseas media, the Independent, even the BBC, uh, the New York Times, The Guardian, I think only the Sydney Morning Herald on a regular basis seems to actually uh, use that source material, the WikiLeaks source material. Mm. So um, I just ask, why is our media uh, so reluctant to, uh, to use that material? You're probably better placed to say why your, um, uh, <laughs> your media is reluctant to use that. I mean, I do... I, I don't think, I mean, I, I would say that the story that was most used um, 
and it certainly wasn't the biggest leak or the most damaging one to the states, were, were the diplomatic cables. And I don't, I, I mean, one can only guess. I mean, I, I mean they were terribly important. I, I mean, without question, I think they, they, that was the most important leak. But um, really, you have to answer that yourselves. <laughs> A question down here at the front. I'm just coming from Pakistan. Uh, I was there about a week ago, and um, as we all know, the state of that country, particularly the social fiber there, it's pretty torn apart. But in direct contrast, I find some of the most amazing investigative journalism in that country. So for the week that I was there, it was hard keeping up with the, with the range of uh, news and publishing and et cetera. Um, and then you land up, and then when you come back home to Australia, it is all, I mean, the only word that one can use is, is it's, it's dead, mm -hmm. apart from, yeah. so, uh, do you think WikiLeaks, and, and investigative journalism, you probably would agree, is, is, is really gone down in the world, um, uh, particularly in developed countries where there used to be so much, so, in some ways, would you say WikiLeaks and Julian Assange are kind of almost like a reaction to the lack of investigative journalism, and can it keep up the momentum? Or? I, I, I mean, so, certainly, it, it, one might say that if the press had been doing its job, and I mean, I sort of hinted at that slightly, and why if all these stories that the ambassadors were writing came from journalists in the first place, why wasn't there more diligence in, in, you know, if that's what everybody thought, including the journalists, why wasn't there more diligence in investigating it? So, I mean, I, I do think that that's an issue and that journalists do get lazy and there is, it, it, it's probably much more comfortable to sort of, to gossip round the edges than to actually go for the, um, for the hard graft. I mean, there's a really, really interesting um, uh, thing ab about the Apache helicopter um, film that Assange made, which, uh, I mean, talk about sort of was that proper journalism. I mean, it was journalism investigating far beyond um, what many, uh, you know, sort of paid, paid up sort of investigative journalists were doing. They went back to Iraq to find the families to, dis to, to be sure that where they were describing a death, it really was a death. Um, so, you know, I mean, uh, certainly they've injected quite a bit of new life into journalism. I mean, that, uh, and, and that's fantastic. But one of the things that is, that it is puzzling, and I mean, this answers you too, about um, the Australian press is that the spirit of, of, of what I see when I come here is this massive sort of interest in all this. I mean, far more interest uh, than, than there is in, in London. And so why haven't the press at least acknowledged that? You'd have thought for economic reasons alone, they would have acknowledged that. So, so it is, I mean, it's puzzling. And I mean, maybe there's quite a lot to do with ownership, but. There's a man there with his uh, hand up. While we get the microphone to him, we'll just perhaps take one from this side. Although there isn't one, so you're next. I'm not sure if this is a question, but um, one thing I guess I would like to thank Julian Assange for is that Apache um, video. Mm. It, it showed um, exactly what I do when I'm playing a video game uh, with helicopters. You know, I, I make all that sort of muttering. I mean, that's, that's I think what was happening with these helicopter pilots. Um, they were just playing a video game. And I think that, that to me was quite shocking. I mean, mm. that's exactly what they were doing, is just playing a video game. What you mean, that when you play a video game, you play in the way oh, yeah, that they yeah, were yeah, doing? Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you're just, oh, you've, you, you haven't got a target anymore, so you'll just shoot something up. And mm. just, in some ways, that's what they were doing. They didn't, they didn't really have a target. They didn't know what to go for. So mm. let's go shoot something up. And it just so happened that they can use the excuse of a, a guy with a, ca a video mm. camera um, or looked like a gun, you know. And I think he has to be thanked for that because what does it say about us? You know, I mean, 
admittedly they're Americans, but Australians aren't that much different. And Australians, British, they're not that much different. And in fact, the British do well, use we the same in helicopters. There, we? Uh, okay, sorry, I'm drawing a long, long bow there, but mm. you know, they, it, it does to me. It, it's quite scary. I mean, that could be me. Yeah. Could could I? Um Slight, uh, just add to that slightly. Um, I mean, I'm really, I, I, I'm glad it was um, a, an important um, sort of experience for you. What I thought was really interesting about that, though, was that uh, as well as publishing on his website the edited version, which did very much um, give that impression, he did also publish the unedited version. And I thought that was slightly morally more ambiguous because it raised the question of whether, uh, with, without going into too much detail, uh, which would bore people who didn't see it, I mean, there's a point, isn't there, where he says um, uh, something like, just, just reach for the gun, just reach for the gun, as if that's going to... And that was interpreted to be um, that then I can shoot you. But it could also have been a nervous sort of, oh, my God, no, no, if, if you, you know, don't reach for the gun, don't reach for the gun. And I thought, I think when you watch the unedited version, it is morally more ambiguous. Yeah. I think that, yeah. No, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm just saying uh, the interesting thing is that he had the courage to do the edited version, to, to edit it, give it the title, Collateral Murder, but also to give you the full footage and therefore the opportunity to make your own mind up. That's quite an interesting excursion in journalism. I've um, got a microphone down here for this lady. Hi, just, just on the question of whether or not what, what um, they're producing is journalism, I've just always wondered whether there isn't um, quite a lot in common with an archive rather than journalism. I just wonder whether what they're producing in some ways as distinct from the videos but whether what he calls scientific journalism is in fact some sort of combination somewhere in between an archive and journalism. I, I'm not quite picking you up. Did you pick that up? I You're wondering if there's not a comparison between... Archive, an archive, and, archive and journalism. He calls it scientific journalism, but I'd say it's, it's, to me it's like a sort of strange combination of something in between an archive and journalism. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, you're, you're, you're talking of, of, of uh, Assange's idea that um, you give all the facts unedited. Um, well, uh, archives aren't always unedited, are they? Um, I mean, archives are, are the work of someone. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Observation. Yes, yeah. A lady up there on the right. Yeah. Hi, just um, a comment on Australian journalism. I heard recently that we're the only country in the world that um, our journalists actually work in the same building as our parliamentarians. So, um, <laughs> pardon? As, a, as a parliamentarian. Oh, right. <laughs> yes. And so I think what you were describing earlier on, the complex sort of to and fro that builds up between, um, you know, our political leaders and our journalists in, you know, developed countries, that perhaps, um, you know, that has a sway on what ends up being published or stories that have gone after or whatever. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, well, I mean... Uh, uh, Journalists work alongside parliamentarians in lots of places, don't they, in, in the, through the lobby system. And that, I mean, that is, that's pretty much sort of something that I think has to be constantly scrutinised because the um, very cosy relationships which develop between uh, lobby journalists and uh, parliamentarians is, um, it, it, I mean, uh, can be dangerous. I mean, the consensus of what's going to be put out between the lobby journalists it can also be dangerous. Um, I, I think it's quite interesting to actually share the same building. I mean, uh, this, I didn't realise that that was the case. Which paper's that? Uh, the Belgian Journal. Oh. Uh, the article is by Kevin, 
that that's that we do have journalists within that's their working environment. Yes, I couldn't yeah. tell you which paper. No, I, so, so yes, I mean, then my answer about the lobby system is appropriate. I mean, there is a danger of journalists be becoming very, very sort of close to um, their, the parliamentary people they're meant to be watching. I don't know how you stop it. You stop it by sort of constant sort of scrutiny. And you stop it also by, um, I mean, it only needs one journalist to break ranks and the rest of them have to too. So, I mean, I think in a way it, it can be, I hope, optimistically, that it can be sort of um, guarded against. Up there in the middle. Cheers. Mm. Um, I was interested at what you just said about lobbyists and what you said about saving face, you know, just keeping things secrets just to save face. Mm. And it occurred to me, how long would it take for, we already uh, for public relations firms to start creating uh, fake leaks in order to distort the truth. We already know they create astroturf campaigns, which make it look like there's grassroots opposition to something that there really isn't. How long would it take for public relations firms to, you know, co-opt systems like WikiLeaks? I, I mean, I, I think that's a terribly interesting question, and. I, I, I mean, it surely must arise um, over some of the leaks we've already had, you know, sort of how many, how, I mean, you know, how can one be sure of accuracy? How can one be sure that uh, people aren't being falsely um, sort of uh, informed of, uh, I mean, the possibilities for subterfuge are, uh, are quite great and I, I'm sure people will start using, and I'm sure companies will start using them, uh, that just as they're already learning um, to use very, very profitably for themselves things like Facebook. So I think there's no question about that. But what will happen? I mean, I think surely what will happen in the end is just, I mean, the, the, the possibility of companies subverting um, uh, uh, magazines and newspapers is also sort of strong. But in the end, you, what wins, uh, one hopes, is the, you come to trust certain journalists, you come to trust certain um, newspapers, and you will come to trust certain sort of drop boxes and, and leaking organisations. But that is also, surely, that is another reason why you don't want these sort of secretive sort of organisations. You don't want them to have to remain secretive. I mean, I completely <coughs> understand why WikiLeaks has to remain secretive, but you, you want them to come under some kind of democratic scrutiny um, because, you know, that, that, that's how such things are prevented, isn't it? Good question. I, uh, I think you just started answering my question. Um, you, you were critical in your, in your talk of, um, I say, the, the democratic input into WikiLeaks at the moment. I was wondering what sort of improvements you'd suggest. Um, it's something that interests me because I can't really think of of specific improvements that you could make to to have that democratic input without, I guess, maybe sabotaging what WikiLeaks is and what it stands for. So I was wondering your opinion on on that. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I, I'm not sure what they can practically do at the moment because uh, I mean it's a beleaguered organisation, isn't it? And that the, the, there's been internal divisions uh, that they no longer at the moment have the key to enable them to accept sort of new submissions because of, uh, of an earlier rift in the organization. So, I mean, these questions aren't easily organized. I, I mean, I, I don't think you can be talking about it as if it's a perfect organization because it, it isn't a perfect organization at the moment. I mean, unfortunately, I, I mean, it, it, it had a year of sort of, of, of utter brilliance and, and it is still, I mean, those leaks, the people are working very, very hard and the, the um, existing leaks are still coming out, but it's not properly functioning at the moment because of, of um, the, the internal organization troubles. And I don't know how you run an organisation anyway where the, um, the main driving force is sort of holed up in a sort of mansion in Norfolk. So, um, so I mean, it's, it's not really sort of um, fair to judge it in that sense. But I do think that in the end, that if you want um, an organisation to which all of us would feel happy giving 
um, making leaks, you know, if we had discovered things we thought were important. But if you, if you really want um, to ensure that anybody with any secret would feel happy to um, sort of put it in WikiLeaks or Wall Street Journal, then you've got to start sort of having some kind of observable democratic controls on them. And you look skeptical. I can see from here that you look skeptical. <laughs> I can't say better than that. We've got up there on the right. Thank you. Just a, a related question. We, we see people that are whistleblowers, they become populist heroes, but time and time again, they end up being so victimized. Now, I, I'm interested, I see it in our own country where we would expect a whistleblower to be treated, you know, they, if, when they're, they're bringing out injustice and they're bringing out problems, and then time and time again, you see their lives falling apart for, for whatever reason. Is it just uh, an issue in our country or are whistleblowers, even when they come up with truth and the like, uh, do they end up getting victimized and that, I don't know why, it just seems a strange thing that happens mm. time and time. Obviously the powers that be don't like it, whether it's embarrassment, whatever it does to them. Is it common? I, I mean, I think, I, I mean, it's, it's a pretty tough business being a whistleblower, isn't it? And I mean, one of the things that, as a journalist, um, that you're always sort of slightly troubled by is that wiki, uh, is that whistleblowers are themselves often quite troubled people. And that's because they've been in a situation where they found out things that they, they're very unhappy with, they've been conflicted in their work. Um, I mean, I mean they, they are quite often not in a very sort of good situation. Now, you add that to that, that they suddenly come into contact with sort of journalists who, you know, quite cynically sometimes are, just want what they've got to offer. I mean, this doesn't happen through the anonymous system. We're talking about the, the old system, but... Um, so, uh, so, you know, they're not, they're sometimes not really sort of particularly stable characters by the end of this. And, you know, quite a lot of the problems that whistleblowers have is that they sort of shot themselves, you know, that they get caught up in the sort of e event of the publicity of their story and then they reveal who they were. Um, so, I mean... Being a whistleblower is a tough thing, and I think one of the, the great things that, that uh, WikiLeaks could have brought to this situation is to ensure that someone could carry on their normal life while whistleblowing and, you know, and make it, one would hope, less risky. Question down here. Um, hello, I was just wondering... Um, when WikiLeaks receives a like file or document in the Dropbox, how do they verify whether or not the document is genuine? How do they know that it hasn't been falsified? I mean, gosh, the answer to that would be as various as the things that are dropped. I'm sure. I mean, I've never been that side of the um, <laughs> that side of the equation. Um, I mean, I think to to go back to the the earlier answer that that what must happen with such organisations. I mean, if we assume that the idea of secret sort of drop boxes um, is going to be replicated and, it, and that one day it's going to sort of seem quite normal for that to be the way in which one sort of gives sort of um, uh, secrets or things you don't want to identify yourself as the source of to the papers, then, I'm, I mean, ultimately, the ones that survive and get the leaks will be the ones that are trusted. And, you know, so uh, if, uh, you know, you, you, you trust them to know when they're being fed rubbish, I suppose... Um, I don't think you can ever be certain. And in fact, I mean, I know that some of the early leaks to, um, to, to WikiLeaks, that one of the, um, the, the, the Julian Assange said that, he, that once, one, one, once a leak was um, uh, 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 processed and published on the site, he wouldn't take it off. Uh, because, and so if someone had phoned up and sort of said, oh, that's a hoax, then he still wouldn't take it off because the possibility of sort of double hoaxing is so strong. So you just, I, I think what you have to do is have systems which are clear and explicit to everyone and that everybody trusts. 
and it doesn't it, and, and it doesn't stop the problem any more than it stops the problem of a journalist being given a false lead you know so there's a question up the very back Isn't there a degree that WikiLeaks is really just a change of power that f instead of the government deciding or legislation deciding what should be public and what should be private for some period of time, that the power is now moved to Julian Assange deciding what should be public through his editing or publishing on WikiLeaks as opposed to maybe what he gets and decides not to put out there? I, I don't entirely disagree with that. I mean, I think that the, there has been a shift in power, but it's been a shift from a situation in which, which the government had all the power and the ability to conceal uh, governments, I mean, not, not this government, um, had uh, uh, the ability to, to conceal um, information they didn't want released and the, the ability to falsify. And some of that power has indeed shifted. And, and that is, I mean, that's the optimism of the situation because you would hope, you would think that the only solution to someone having the power to sort of reveal all your falsehoods is that you stop telling falsehoods. I mean, that's, <laughs> that I hope is, is um, uh, you know, the, the, the abiding legacy of WikiLeaks. So if we're gonna have a question. Oh. Perhaps we'll make this the last question. We're up against the clock, as ever. I hope this is okay to do it twice. Um, the, you, you said in your talk that uh, this has changed the ball game, but mm. I, I can't help but think to myself that this is just following a long tradition, especially in the US, of either courier companies, uh, people working for courier companies or working for... Uh, the CIA or their various secret agencies leaking documents. Um, uh, Deep Throat is another good example with the FBI. Um, now, the only only real difference here, well, I don't know if there's that much difference because you have the embarrassment, someone gets 40 years. Um, mm. In Deep Throat, he wasn't revealed until the very, until almost his death. Um, I'm just wondering, what do you think has changed? How has it changed? What, what makes, I mean, to me, it just, it's just a, a circle uh, that's never ending. What, why do you think it's changed? Um, well, I mean, it, it goes in incremental steps. You're completely right. I mean, you, you, you might say that uh, the more, thing, you know, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose, you know, it's sort of, and that you go on, um, uh, you, uh, the journalists get ahead in one one means of, of sort of trying to get information in terms of sort of contacts and and the government comes back with a sort of tighter security and then you find a new one but I mean what is I, I mean what what is game changing about this is that I don't think anybody has ever really sort of um, I don't think there's ever been quite such a, a matching of skills. I mean, and that is the great sort of, uh, the, the, I mean, that, that's the great triumph of, of WikiLeaks and Assange particularly, I think, that he, I mean, you know, I mean, it's a very, very audacious task to say, okay, I, not only am I going to provide the basis for people to be able to leak, but when I get them, I'm actually, I'm not going to be deterred and I think, I think that has changed things. I mean, I think people now sort of think, well, you know, we want the truth. And, I mean, it's a very simple mindset, mind shift in the rest of us. It's not just a game of journalists and leakers and governments. It's what it's done to the rest of us that we sort of think, okay, well, you can get the truth, you know, and you can, you, you, you can expose lies, and if you can expose lies, then people have to stop telling them or else be exposed. And surely that does change things, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Could I ask you all to thank uh, Barbara yeah. Gunnell? <laughs> Excellent session.